Having access to enough food for a healthy life is a problem in every country, even here in the U.S. One of the wealthiest nations in the world, millions of people face uncertainty about where their next meal is coming from. They schooled me in a, in a way of thinking about the future that was about transforming the world. Raj Patel wants to change that. As a food activist, he travels the world speaking about the politics and policies of food. I met Raj while he was visiting Washington, D.C. He believes the struggle for a sovereign food system is very much a fight for social and economic justice. In every human being, and every primate, there's a sense of, that's not fair. And all of us have it. And you, know, you can hear it in any playground near you, right? That's not fair. It's one of the sort of rou you know, the rousing cries among children. But all of us have a sense of that's not fair. And for me, uh, my activism is a way of, of, of honoring that feeling of that's not fair. And you know, activism is the rent that we pay to live on this, on this planet. Raj is a British American writer and academic. He's a research professor at the University of Texas in Austin and author of the book, Stuffed and Starved. Markets, Power, and the Hidden Battle for the World's Food System. The book explains the steps needed for the world to regain control of the global food economy. Raj, back in 1993, I was in Somalia, and, and I will never forget uh, seeing these emaciated children, basically skin and bones. Um, and those memories are, are seared there forever. And I know you've had experiences like that. Can you talk to me about the first time you saw hunger face to face, and what kind of impact that had on you? The first time I saw hunger that I can remember, I was five years old, uh, and my parents had taken my brother and I to India, um, the land of our ancestors, and we were in Bombay, as it was then called, and we were uh, in a car in the monsoon, and the rain was hammering down on the roof, and there was a girl standing by the stoplight, um, and she was uh, asking for money, and she was begging, and she was holding an infant in her arms, and I was looking up at her, and I was, uh, I, I, I still can't find the words to describe how taken aback I was. Um, I, I wanted to know why it was that she had no money and we had money, why she had no food and we were, we'd just eaten, why she was wet and we were dry. Um, and my parents sort of cracked down the window and pushed some money through the crack and, and we sped off into the night. Um, but that girl has stayed with me. Um, and in fact, as soon as we returned back to Britain, I started renting out my toys at kindergarten for, you know, for famine relief. Uh, but that image of hunger, of someone begging, someone, a child begging for food and begging for money, um, is something that struck me when I was five, but it, it uh, sadly is uh, all too prevalent. It, it, one doesn't have to journey to India to, to, to see that, even in America today. You said that the reason people die of hunger is not because of food shortages. Um, and that might, people might be, huh? So explain why. It does seem like a counterintuitive idea that, that if you're dying of hunger, that there clearly must be not enough food around. Um, but the Nobel uh, laureate uh, Amartya Sen pointed out that in the Bengal famine in, uh, in the 1940s, uh, there was plenty of food around, but it was being speculated upon. So if you were rich enough to be able to afford food, the, the financially sound thing to do was to invest in food and sell it at some later point, because you know you could make money out of it. But if you're poor and you can't afford anything, there's no food to be found at a, at a reasonable price, and so you go hungry. And that idea that because of a failure not of the availability of food, but a failure of entitlements, uh, people starve. That idea is really the sort of cornerstone of Amartya Sen's work. Uh, now, these days, we are seeing a rise in the increase, a rise in the number of people who are going hungry. Uh, today, as I say, there are 821 million people who are chronically malnourished. That means they're, they're hungry for a year at least. Uh, and that, that is, is a sign not just of, uh, of sort of acute poverty, but it, it's also related to a, a range of other things, particularly conflict and climate change. Uh, and those are definitely create sort of supply bottlenecks in certain parts of the world. Um, but in general, hunger isn't about the availability of food. I mean, as a planet, we have more than enough food to feed everyone well. Uh, the problem remains right now a problem of distribution. And so if you want to sort of really pull away at this, think about corporate power, think about corporate concentration, because uh, if you look at, you know, 
pick a, a food type, any food type, you'll find that globally uh, more than 50% of the world market is controlled by four or five large corporations. And those corporations have every interest in uh, keeping the status quo rather than addressing these deep problems of labor, of environment, and of animal welfare. Roz likens the global food distribution system to an hourglass. On one end, you have the producers who grow the food. On the other end, the consumers. But in the middle, the distribution pipeline narrows. Zero in on most any food industry, and you can see how much control big corporations have. Take the beef slaughtering business. Just four companies control more than 80% of the U.S. market. Raw says this kind of concentration of power means corporations can set pricing, determine the types of seeds farmers can plant, and even manipulate our understanding of what's considered healthy. I lived in St. Louis uh, at one point and, and right across the river in Illinois, you'd see the big Monsanto plant. Uh, we know that uh, corporations have been active in, in food science and that sort of thing. Give me some examples of, of how they've had an influence. Well, so for a long time, for example, uh, in the United States, uh, we were very worried about our fat intake. And uh, you, you could see on the side of our labels uh, quite how much fat there was. Um, but sugar was never really there. I mean, you, you couldn't tell how much added sugar there was, for example, in, in any given uh, product. Uh, and that's because uh, through the 1970s, the sugar industry did a very good job uh, of deflecting the increasing amount of science that was uh, pointing towards sugar being very bad um, in the, the, the quantities that we were eating it in the United States uh, for health uh, and associated with things like type 2 diabetes um, and uh, you know, various kinds of endocrine disorders. Uh, so the, the, the industry itself has sort of intervened in uh, either suppressing or in uh, promoting uh, you know, the dissembling of, uh, of, of, of science around its products. Um, but you know, essentially, the, the, the techniques that the, the tobacco industry has long uh, embraced of sowing fear, uncertainty, and doubt um, have, have worked very well around um, everything from you know, sort of glyphosate uh, and uh, you know, pesticide use um, to the, the, what we're seeing now, uh, the big debates around how much ultra-processing of food uh, causes uh, or is associated with um, uh, obesity and overweight. So absolutely, through, through the sponsoring of professional associations, through the releasing of certain kinds of report, um, through ganging up on uh, scientists who, who stand up to, uh, to, 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 you know, to these large corporations, um, you, you see very targeted kinds of approaches, uh, all of which are designed to muddy the, the clarity with which the scientific community can approach um, these deep issues of, of nutrition and toxicology. The people most impacted by hunger are the people producing the food we eat. Up to 80% of the world's chronically hungry are farmers, according to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. If you look at the food industry in the United States, seven of the 10 worst paying jobs in America are in the food business. Um, not just farming in the fields, but restaurant work, you know, the, the, the tipped uh, minimum wage for, for federal for, at the federal level is two dollars and fourteen cents an hour, um, and no one can live on that in the United States. Uh, so you know, th th there are uh, layers of, of, of low wages baked into the food system, uh, and when your you know your food system is premised on exploiting workers, uh, you set up a, a system that's really geared towards producing this cheap food. Uh, and the cheap food then uh, fuels the obesity crisis, uh, and it fuels uh, the need to exploit the land and to exploit um, you know, livestock uh, and to drive climate change, because all of these never feature in the price of food. Uh, and so uh, I, I certainly think a good place to start unpeeling the layers is around looking at how um, workers are paid, how the environment is treated, uh, and certainly how our, our relationship to the rest of the web of life has been transformed by this immense corporate power. Today, throughout most of the world, being overweight or obese kills more people than being underweight, according to the World Health Organization. Raj says being overweight and being hungry are both points on the spectrum of poverty. 
there's 821 million people who are chronically malnourished, really badly off for over a year, and nearly 2 billion people um, who are overweight. And it happens through the same kinds of dynamics, where if cheap food is the kind of food that is ultra-processed, that is subsidized, that is uh, likely to be obesogenic, and fresh fruits and vegetables, the kinds of diet that is going to be you know, rich and good for your body, um, is going to be more expensive in this, this new food economy. And so if we're you know, in this sort of period of globalization where workers' wages find themselves going lower and lower, uh, that means that uh, in communities you know, from right outside this door to uh, you know, uh, you know, a world away, find themselves in a similar position where if you have zero money, then you are not able to eat at all. But if you have a little, then you're only able to afford cheap food, and that food is likely to make you more overweight. Uh, and sometimes within the same household, you can see people who are malnourished at the same time as people who are overweight because of poverty. And I think once we understand that, we can work back to see, well, what is it that, that's generating this poverty? You say the policies from the IMF and the World Bank simply don't work. How should they be rejiggered, do you think? The, the policies that the World Bank and the IMF have undertaken have, have been about liberalizing the economy and about encouraging uh, you know, countries in the global south to specialize in certain kinds of agricultural product and to bring in the latest in uh, US technology or you know, European technology to be able to you know, create these amazing monocultures and somehow then uh, the money will trickle down and uh, you know, poverty will be ended. Uh, but the World Bank itself a few years ago admitted that uh, its long history of following these ideas um, hadn't really worked out for the rural poor. And poverty in the global south had for a very long time been really concentrated in rural areas. And the, the World Bank had, had missed this entirely. Um, I don't think, though, that uh, the World Bank is in a good place to fix things. It's like, ice, uh, you know, like asking the iceberg to fix the Titanic. Uh, I, I don't think that it's uh, that the World Bank is the sort of organization that can do the, the sorts of uh, investment in uh, grassroots uh, transformation uh, that's really required so that everything from labor rights to e ecological uh, farming to uh, land policy can be addressed. Instead, unfortunately, the kinds of things that they are able to do is tinker with economic policy so that land is you know, moved from one hand to another, but it goes from poor to rich rather than the other way around. La Via Campesina is just one example the grassroots organizing Raj is talking about. The movement, which is Spanish for the peasant's way, was founded in 1993 by farmers across six continents. Its mission cuts across several issues, including food sovereignty, land and water reform, and migrant workers' rights. I think about the trade war uh, between China and the United States and these bankruptcies, uh, huge numbers in, in, in the Dakotas, Minnesota, you know, Montana. But these aren't corporations that are going under. These are like family farmers, right? And, and one of the things you talk about in your book is Monsanto and these, these corporations that just kind of, their tentacles are everywhere. Um, do they benefit from a trade war, whereas the, the poor farmer who's just slogging away in, in Iowa suffers? In a trade war, you see increased volatility in prices. And there are people in Wall Street that are making out like bandits because volatility is good if you're in the, the business of trading and hedging and uh, looking to, to make money in arbitrage. Uh, but for the large companies, they would rather that the trade war went away. Uh, but they're not feeling the pain quite as much as uh, small family farmers. I mean, in the United States, uh, we, we learned that the average income of the smallest uh, level of family farmers um, is negative one sorry, negative one thousand seven hundred dollars. And uh, so, when uh, the, the trade war comes along, and uh, you have to figure that uh, you know you're not going to be able to, to sell your crop in in the ways that you're used to, um, who comes knocking at your door? It's the bank. Uh, and the, the struggle that farmers in the United States, but around the world face, is that they're hev heavily leveraged. They are deeply in debt. And when you're that deeply in debt, the smallest ripple can drown you. And uh, the trade war may be uh, ameliorated by some of the, the, the funds that have been sent uh, to, to, the, you know, to, to the farming community by the US government. But sometimes it's not coming in time. And that's been compounded this year 
by spectacularly bad weather, weather that, that most people uh, attribute to the kinds of fluctuations we can associate with climate change. Uh, and so now uh, harvests are projected to be incredibly bad. Insurance payments won't cover um, the, the full scale of the loss. And we can imagine uh, a range of, of family farmers going bankrupt uh, in another wave of, of these bankruptcies. And then consolidation of farmland in the hands of fewer and fewer people. Mm, which doesn't benefit us in the long run. Well, I mean, if you like uh, competition and free exchange, then the thing you must hate is monopoly. And we're seeing uh, increasing concentration of, uh, of monopoly power everywhere in the food system, and we're seeing the concentration of land in the United States, too. And that brings me to NAFTA, because one of the things I thought was really interesting about your writing is, is NAFTA is supposed to be this great thing, but then in Mexico, you see all these people who are growing corn, and slowly but surely, they start losing business and their livelihoods. Talk to me about how, uh, again, in, in this case, how the big boys win, the little guys suffer. Well, what was odd about NAFTA was that originally the United States uh, didn't anticipate that Mexico would offer agriculture as one of the areas in which there would be free trade. Uh, the U.S. understood full well that if um, Mexican farmers were forced to compete against the might of American subsidy, they'd be wiped out. But it was the Mexican government that said, no, 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 um, we need to modernize our farming industry. And that means that the small scale peasant farmers um, need to be you know, faced with the bracing winds of competition. Uh, and so it was that uh, Mexico agreed to put uh, corn on, on the trading block. Uh, waves of American corn came into uh, Mexico underpriced uh, because of all the subsidies that Americans gave. And uh, it meant that, that Mexican farmers couldn't survive. They couldn't make a living. Uh, and as a result, there was migration from the, the country to the city. And then there was migration from the towns of Mexico to, uh, to the United States, where there were jobs. Uh, and you can trace those waves of migration uh, directly to NAFTA. But you can also trace things like the arrival of uh, U.S. food products, processed food. Uh, and there's a very interesting study that, that notices that uh, you, can, you can see a jump in the, the, the sort of forces behind uh, the obesity crisis in Mexico as a direct result of NAFTA. Um, so yes, uh, absolutely, you know, the, the, the you know, corporate power wins both ways, both by finding new markets for their products um, and by uh, displacing Mexican farmers and, and there, there being cheap labor for uh, work in the United States. In 1999, Seattle hosted the World Trade Organization's top conference. Tens of thousands of protesters showed up on the streets to call for workers' rights, environmental and social protections, and the curbing of multinational corporations' power. Raj was one of the organizers and among the protesters tear gassed by riot police. Two decades later, Raj is still fighting for those issues. Ask you about you as an activist because uh, there's a passion in your voice as you talk about this, and, and I know that's a big part of who you are. How did you become an activist, and and uh, and what's the feeling out there? Pushing, pushing, pushing. Uh, do you feel as though it's kind of like pushing a, a rock up a hill, or or do you feel as though yes, incrementally we're making a difference? Well, I, I mean, I've, I've told you the story about you know hunger in India. I mean, the, the, my my becoming an activist was when I was five, and you know. The, the kindergarten rental, and as you say, throwing a penny into a fountain, but um, that's how it starts. But for me, you know, there are good days and bad. I mean, particularly my friends who are climate change activists have it tough because there's no good news coming. Every day it's bad news and worse news and worse news. Uh, but for me, at the intersection of food and climate change and justice, uh, I, I get a few more breaks because, first of all, um, in the food world, food is joyful. And for at least three meals a day, I get to experience joy by eating with my family or my friends or my community. And that becomes a moment of, uh, an almost sacred moment where you, you get to have, have a meal with other people and we get to celebrate something. Uh, and to give thanks for that, that connection to the, the work, the labor, the transformation that made the food possible, that is a high point for me. Uh, so yes, there are, there's, there's usually bad news every day, um, but the good news comes in the, the sort of commensality and the, the, the sort of human connection that makes a good meal possible. And that is the rocket fuel that, that can sometimes, you know, that, that you need in order to be able to move forward. 